So Ben, what are we talking about today? Yeah, so Bradford and I are going to do more of a conversation today. We're talking about a thing called kingdom ethics. Ooh, exciting. Ethics sounds like a pretty boring word, if I'm honest with you. But who, who knows what ethics are? Yeah, kind of. It's like half-hand. Like, I know, but don't ask me, because I don't want to put... <laughs> don't want to wrap... Don't want to wrap language around it. Basically, ethics is moral, moral principles or duties that inform your behavior, right? So let's pretend that um, I'm going to make one up that we're not going to talk about today. We're, going to, we're not talking about how God is good. If you really have an ethical understanding that, that the Lord is really, really good, that his nature is good, that will inform how you act. It will. If you think that he's bad, that will inform how you act. Right, So we're talking about some concepts today that I would synonymously, synonymously change out kingdom ethics for kingdom culture. Or you could say that kingdom ethics will produce kingdom culture. Yeah. And these are so important. Let me explain why. Before healing existed... Before the the, uh, the deliverances existed, before humanity existed, ethics existed. Um, God is love. Love existed at the well, not creation of God, but if God is unending, that means that love is unending, and love is one of the principles in which we're going to talk about today. So this is so important for two reasons. Number one. This ethic, these ethics we're talking about, existed for however long period of time it was before we were on the earth today. And guess what? They're going to post-exist as well. We pass on. I'm not, probably not going to be doing deliverances in heaven. I'm probably not going to be healing people in heaven, the, the new heavens and the new earth. I really hope that that's not the case. I can prove to you that it's not. Prove it in Scripture. But I will be loving. I will be loving. And I will be walking in humility. And I will be walking in honor. And those are the three we're going to talk about, right? Correct. Those are the three. So we, we, we kind of were joking. We we're like, you know, if we, if we were to make a list of kingdom ethics, I mean, it's probably an inexhaustible list <laughs> of, of these ethics that make up the kingdom of God. So we, we narrowed it down to three. And these are the three that we're going to talk about that we think could probably be connected to every other ethic of the kingdom. And so the three that we're going to talk about is humility, love, and honor. Or you said it, honor, humility, then love. doesn't really matter. It's inexchangeable. But those are the three we're going to touch on today. Yeah. And so can I ask you a question? Yeah. What, why is it important that we understand that these values don't originate with us? Oh, okay. Let's pick on love again. So God creates, and he sees that humanity is functioning. I say, oh, we've got a problem. They're not, treating, they're not treating each other kindly. We need to create love to fix this. If that were the case, then we wouldn't carry forward. But it's so important that we understand that these things pre- and post-exist because they're how God chooses to function. He chooses how he functions. And he chose humility. He chose honor. And he chose love. And so if we connect with these three things, we're actually looking a lot like our Heavenly Father. We're, we're actually kind of connecting to an eternal lifestyle. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did I answer Absolutely. your question? Yes. Great. Yeah. Um, I wanted to pick on humility and honor because I can argue that love existed because God existed because God is love, right? Love is not God, but God is love. We've heard that before. God existed forever, so love existed forever. But what about humility and what about honor? Well, before the earth was created, someone fell. Who was that? It was the Satan, yes. You're getting ready, I like it. And um, when he fell, he decided that he would take a side and put worship towards himself. I choose to be exalted. And what happened? Jesus says, I saw him fall like lightning. He lost his spot because he didn't choose humility 
and he didn't choose honor, he chose pride and dishonor. So if pride and dishonor exist pre-earth, what are their opposites? Humility, Humility and, honor. and honor. Yeah. So this is like the, the character of God. This is the, the makeup of God's character that uh, has always existed. And so being made in his image, we were made to be like him. He didn't bring these things into existence because of sin. Amen. So there's a scripture uh, in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 12. It really ties into this, this topic we're talking about, about the fall of Satan. Uh, it says, before a downfall, the heart is haughty. It says in Ezekiel 28 that his, his heart was, was puffed up in a sense. He was, he was in love with his own image. He took to his own beauty and his own liking. I've been there before. <laughs> um. I'm joking. <laughs> but I'm also not joking. Well, so. probably not. <laughs> we've, all, we've all sinned and fallen short. But um, anyway, so, but the next part of that verse says that it says, B- before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility goes before honor. And so we see this direct connection between humility and honor. And what we believe is that love, honor, and humility can really be all tied together, and they really function well together. Um, uh, I'll jump ahead of the message a little bit, but there's one way in which Jesus described himself. Do you know what it is? He said in Matthew 11, I think it's 29, he said, I am humble. He said, I am, I am meek and lowly in heart. I am gentle and lowly in heart. The word lowly is humble. So the one character description that Jesus ever gave of himself was meekness and humility. They're very, very closely related. And so if God is love and God is humble then these things probably really closely intertwine if this is the eternal character and makeup of God. And if we were made in his image, we need to see him rightly in these aspects because the reality is we become what we behold. And if we have a misconception of God, then we, we will become that misconception. But the more that we come to know him, the more we will be like him. That's why the scripture says uh, on that day when he returns, we will, we will see him as he is and we shall be like him for we will see him. So there's this direct connection between seeing and becoming. And when we come to know the Lord, we're, we're transformed, it says, into the same image, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And so, yeah. yeah. So shall we hit honor? So if you're taking notes, point one. If you're not taking notes, no shame. I rarely take notes. Unless Tom's watching this, then I do take notes all the time. Um, yes, Tom. <laughs> uh, point one is we're going to talk about honor. Honor says that you have a place at the table. Dishonor says you've lost your spot, but you can earn it by your hands and not your heart. Honor looks to place you in a constant table of family. It's like a metaphor, right? Dishonor is a relationship with your, with your works and what you can produce. Let me paint an analogy. I have an uncle. I have a few uncles, but I've got one uncle. I've, well, that's not true. I've got a few uncles. So uh, I've got a few uncles, and I'm going to pick one of them. And um, let's pretend that he's got, some, he's got a lot of good stuff going on. He's like, got some wisdom here. He's good with finances over here. But there's some other stuff that I don't really like about my uncle. He's rude. He's got uh, this going on. He's doing this behind the scenes, right? Well, that doesn't make him any less my uncle. Even though he's... I'm making this up, right? This is not my real uncle. I guess they're watching. But if he's doing all this behind the scenes, that doesn't make him any less in direct relationship with me, relationship with me via a title, uncle. Him loving me really, really, really well doesn't make him more my uncle, nor does it make him less my uncle. Honor has to do with seeing you in the place that the Lord gives you. So person to person in this room, brother and sister, right? Unless you're married, then brother and sister plus some extra stuff. Um, You don't lose your spot at the table. 
In fact, the Lord calls us to honor all people, which we'll get into in a second. But uh, I have a friend who I did school with, and he, uh, we, we were just walking around one day. In fact, we were having a drink, and he was coming over, and we were like um, making food together. And he low-key just drops this line. He says, yeah, there was once upon a time I used to be paralyzed from the waist down. And I was like, well, his name was Joel. I'm like, Joel, that's a big thing to quickly drop. And he said, yeah, he was born normal. Uh, he, he was born without um, any, any, any paralyzation in his body. But he, he had an accident at one point in time. And he lost his ability to move. He had, I think, spinal damage. From, from the top of my head, getting some of this story wrong, had spinal damage. He couldn't move his legs at all. So he goes to the hospital. They give him a wheelchair. They do all this stuff. He's in a wheelchair. And one day, this little kid comes up to him. And I'm not sure if it was at church or at his house or whatever. And this little kid looks at him and he says, J23. J23. And Joel could have had an opportunity to respond to this kid and be like, that kid had a lot of cordial. Or what do you call it? That kid had a lot of juice today. He's just walking up saying, J23, J23. But he felt the Lord on what this kid said. And he recognized there was something prophetic about that. Well, a few weeks passed and he realized, J23. I just wonder if that's January 23rd. And he started building his faith. I think I'm going to get healed on the 23rd of January. And it's like October. So he's waiting. So much so that midnight on the 22nd of January, he's sitting in his bed. I don't know if it was in the hospital or not. And he's waiting. He's like, I built my faith with his legs. Come on, let's go. Nothing happens. Late that evening, his legs start to work. He's got a kid now. He's married. I never knew him to be paralyzed, but he was paralyzed for for a season of time. I think it was a number of years. And I just thought to myself, like he he honored he he uh, he honored that kid who had that vague prophetic J two three. He wasn't an esteemed prophet. He didn't have twenty three years of rich history with the Lord and like twenty eight good prophecies to back him up. He was a little kid. He wasn't Paul Cain. Yeah, he wasn't Paul Cain. (laughs) Those are some well-known prophets that have both passed away. But he didn't even make much sense. J two three. It was it was Joel that put it all together and let the Lord work on work in his heart. And I would say that's where honor takes you. It doesn't look for the qualification. Well, I can trust you. I trust Michael. Michael is a prophet of the Lord, and he's got the years to back it up. But there are times that there'll be a nine-year-old that's just as prophetic. And we honor the prophet because we we get the prophet's reward. Do you have any thoughts on honor? Um, Well, the the word in scripture used for honor is is usually, it's the same word for glory. It's kavod. 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 Coffee. It's it's Tom's Coffee Company. Yeah. (laughs) So redemption points, Tom, oh. because we're trying to get you some business at the moment. Sorry for not taking notes. <laughs> but one of the one of the like definitions or, or origins of the word it, it means weighty. It means that which is very weighty. And so um, in in their culture, value was determined by weight. The more some the more weight that something had the more value it had. Gold was determined by how, how weighty it was. And so when we honor people, we're, in a sense, we're ascribing to them the value that they carry in the eyes of God. Amen. So it says in 1 Peter 2.17 here, it says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And so we're called to honor all people. Believer, unbeliever alike, we are, to, uh, we are to honor people. Why? Because they're, they're made in the image and likeness of God. Yeah. They actually have incredible value. People aren't worthless to God. He, he, sh- he, he shed the blood of his son to redeem mankind. And so value is always determined by the price that is willing to be paid for it. 
I, there's this analogy a, a guy uses that's really good. That if you go to a car dealership and they're selling a car for, you know, say seventeen thousand dollars, and uh, you're, you're talking to the dealer about it, and you're like, "Yeah, that sounds really good." You know what? I'll give you twenty-two for it. It's like nobody would ever do that. Why? Because it's not worth it. You're not going to pay more for something than what it's worth. And in the same way. The, the cross, in a sense, reveals how valuable mankind is to God. Because he didn't redeem us, the scripture says, with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of the Lamb of God. The most valuable resource in eternity was the blood of Jesus, who was slain from before the foundation of the world, was the price paid to redeem you and me. And when we recognize how valuable mankind is, we can begin to honor all people. We can begin to ascribe to honor. And I love, I love, uh, um, you had had this point about it's, it's not just like overlooking people's junk. It's I'm going to focus on who you are and not who you're not. Right? Sean Bowles has this saying about prophecy. And he says the way that he chooses to prophesy is to look at someone as if they've just finished their race on the earth and they're standing before Jesus to see them in there perfection in that moment and call out what he sees, not what he doesn't see. Because honor isn't turning like a blind eye towards people's dysfunction. I've got dysfunction. Some of you can probably see it. I'm just joking, but I'm also not joking. But, um, but it doesn't mean ignoring it. It just means you see people as they are. You see people as the Lord sees them, not as they're not. You, we see people as they are, not as they do. Amen. That's really good. That's a good word. <laughs> yeah. See people as they are through a lens of identity. Yeah. Not through a lens of works. Did, Jesus probably did this really well versus like anybody else, right? Mm. Well, I mean, like his disciples, there's times that he rebukes them and says, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> and yet he chose them to be on his top 12. So it's like... Yeah. I maybe wouldn't have picked the guy that you're going to call Satan later. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> There's this one example, though, with Zacchaeus, right? Zacchaeus was like a super corrupt tax collector, like a wicked man. Very, like, ripping people off, running all types of, of scams, and just cutting people off of their money, like greedy, like, you know, all the... He had all the qualifications, so to speak, of what people would like find fault with man for. And Jesus comes to him and he says, Zacchaeus. And the word Zacchaeus, the name means pure one. Wow. And Jesus calls him by his true name and says, pure one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come and eat at your house today. And for some, I mean, Jesus is king. You know, he came as king, and to have a king choose to stay in your house was one of the, is, is like the highest honor. And they didn't fully understand that he was king. They didn't fully honor him for that. But the truth is, Jesus was king, and he wanted to dine in Zacchaeus' house, and he chose to call him pure, and even in the midst of all of his corruption. And when Jesus honored him and ascribed worth to him and value to him and didn't point out his sin, Zacchaeus came and confessed it and repented of it. So when Jesus loved Zacchaeus and honored Zacchaeus and showed him like honor and love, it, it says the goodness of God leads man to repentance. And when Jesus focused on who Zacchaeus was rather than who he wasn't, it caused Zacchaeus to forsake who he wasn't so that he could truly be who he was. That's, so good. That's what honor does. Kingdom ethics point you to your true identity. That's a good word. They don't pull out who you're not. They Amen. remind you of who you are. Amen. Sometimes when I am having a moment in life, Sarah will turn to me and she'll say, can I just remind you of who you are? And those words carry so much power because it's like I can see through a correct perspective when I remember who I am. That's why ethics are so important. Amen. So honor isn't just... A, a, a dysfunctional way of ignoring sin, honor is actually a way of, of dealing with sin. Yeah. 
It's a way of, of leading people to their true identity, and it actually empowers them to live out their true identity. Yeah, that's so good. So in terms of like walking out your true identity, can we talk about humility and how like uh, you, ha- you made this point where you've got kind of three assets that connect to humility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I really feel something on this honor thing, though. Go for it. I, yeah. It's just there's something really profound about being able to uh, honor someone for who they are. Uh, Bill Johnson says it this way. He says, he says, in a culture of honor, you honor people who, for who they are without stumbling over who they're not. And there's times when people will give us many reasons, even maybe one another, that we like, it's like, I do not want to honor you right now. Like, you are acting a fool. But it takes a place of humility to be able to look past that and honor them. So I think that's why Proverbs says, before honor comes humility, or humility comes before honor. Um, And we see that that's what Jesus did. You know, he... He treated the ungodly as though they were godly. He came and treated them as though they already belonged in the kingdom. And so I, I've heard someone say, we, we treat people um, as though they belong before they believe. And by, by accepting them into the, it says in Romans 15, we're to accept one another to the glory of God. And it leads one another to him in a sense. Um, but yes, the thing about humility, um, there's, there, I, I preached a sermon about humility uh, a year ago, and I kind of just made like these three points about it. Um, and the number one was that humility is the pathway to God's presence, or it's the doorway to his presence. The second point was that humility is the key to reconciliation. And the third point was that humility was the, is the pathway to destiny. And so I, I gave the analogy that like the, the Spirit of God is likened unto water, right? Well, water always runs first to the lowest place. The first place that water goes is the lowest place. And when we choose to humble ourselves, we're the first ones, in a sense, to receive the Holy Spirit. We're the first ones to come into the presence of God. Um, Humility being the key to reconciliation. Jesus humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. And it was his death that opened the door of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And so in Christ's humility, he was able to freely forgive and, and open the door for relationship. And instead of choosing to break relationship in the midst of offense, he chose to press towards relationship and make covenant with us in the midst of offense. Um, and so I gave, I, I talked about in the last service how um, the Lord led me on this journey of kind of unveiling uh, some word definitions to me and how it really is his countenance or his disposition towards mankind. And one of them being humility, and specifically he led me to the word meekness. And uh, in the Webster's Dictionary, the word meek means to be patient under injuries. To be patient under injuries. And the other word in, in Romans 3, it says, the, the forbearance of God. In the forbearance of God, he passed over all the sin previously committed. And so the word forbearance means uh, to be indulgent toward offenders or enemies. And I just was thinking about these words, and I was like, that perfectly describes the cross. That the more beatings that Jesus took the more patience he showed towards man, which love is patient. And he, he willingly hung on the cross without complaining about it. And it says that love is not provoked. And so he kept no record of wrongs, but rather said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. If Christ was proud, he would not have endured false accusation. Amen. He wouldn't have. And so learning of him, he says, come to me, all you who weary and are heavy laden, learn of me and you'll find rest for your soul. That really taught me in that season that uh, really a key to, to, 
to living free from offense and unforgiveness is to walk in humility. Yeah. And if, if, if even Jesus, who is the absolute most perfect man, could not please men, then don't feel bad about it when you don't either. <laughs> he said, if they hated me, they're definitely going to hate you. <laughs> like, if, if there's one person who was faultless, absolutely pure and perfect in every way, they still found fault with him. Yeah. He still wasn't enough. And so that just really encourages me, like when, when we're still not enough to the world or to other people, don't beat yourself up about it. Don't let them be, beat you up about it. If the one who was without reproach was reproached, the, the one who was unimpeachable, in a sense, was impeached, then how much more when he, he freely gives us his identity, his righteousness, his forgiveness. And so it's like, you know what? If, if Jesus couldn't perfectly please man, then I'm not going to attempt to either. And I'm going to freely forgive as I've freely been forgiven. So honor is about seeing others through the way that the Lord has created them to be. Humility involves seeing yourself through the way that the Lord created you to be. Let me explain why. So Jesus was super misunderstood, right? Like if I was there, I'd be like, Jesus, you are so misunderstood right now. You're being killed for something that isn't really fair, if you want to put it that way. And he let it be. Well, when he's being accused and they're saying all these things about him that aren't true, he knew what the truth was. He knew what the Lord said about, I guess, said about himself and what his father said to him. He knew what was true of himself. And that is what enables you to walk in humility. If you don't connect to the truth of it, you're actually walking what they call like false humility. False humility is pride. <laughs> Just to put it really simply, false humility is pride. It, it looks like humility. It smells it like humility. It can feel like humility. Smell like humility, but really... It tastes like humility. It's pride. I, I love the... the <laughs> it's, it's a bitter aftertaste, though. <laughs> it's bitter. Um, I listened to Bill preach on uh, the, the parable. It's one of the parables that Jesus taught, of course. <laughs> um, but it's, it's the one where the good, the good farmer scatters good seed... And then he wakes up the next day and there's, there's good and bad seed. And he says, an enemy has done this. So there's the wheat and there's the tares, right? The parable of the wheat and tares. Yeah. Um, he says, don't uproot the wheat lest you also up, or don't uproot the tares lest you uproot the wheat with them. And uh, what Bill was saying was like, sometimes you, we can see two people in a sense uh, growing in God. One is coming through self-promotion. One is coming by the Spirit. And he said, but it's very hard to discern in a sense. And he said, the way that you discern is you just let it happen. Because what will, it'll begin to expose itself. Because what happens is tares never stop growing up. Wow. But wheat, when they ripen and bear their fruit, they begin to bow because of the weight of, of their fruit. And wheat will always bear the fruit of humility, whereas tares, will always, it'll always continue to be about them. And so... It's kind of how you discern between a true prophet and a false prophet. Is a, a true prophet will point people to Jesus, but a false prophet will point them to themselves. And so, That's yeah. That's really good. I did not talk about that in the last service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I was kind of humbled the other day when... Um, I had someone uh, reach out. Well, I reached out to them and they reached back. And they, they're like a, a, a very notable songwriter, someone who I really admire. And I was just kind of like throwing the seed out there to see whether or not uh, we might be able to write together. You know, you go on Instagram and you're like, I know that they've got 400 million followers, but I'm going to message Justin Bieber and see if he responds. Right? It's like one of those moments. But they responded... And we, we wrote a song together. And I remember one of the things that they said was, 
it's such an honor to write with you. Um, and she talked about being humbled by the experience because she, she had heard a song I'd written. And I was like, what the heck? Like, I'm the one who's, who's in the humble seat right now. But to be honest with you, if Jesus is the one with the exalted seat and he chooses honor the most, then that means it's going to be a lifestyle of humility. And I shared this last service. Uh, what's the opposite of humility? Pride. Pride. Pride comes before a fall. So f- choose to fall first. Be the one that chooses to fall in humility and honor the lowest of the low. Be humble to serve the lowest of the low in your eyes, whatever that looks like. Choose to fall. You're going to get there. You're going to get there anyway. Walk in pride comes before a fall. So choose to fall. Amen. Amen. It's a good word, Ben. I can't wait to hear your song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, do you have any more thoughts on honor? Or shall we progress into love? I'll, I have a couple notes I'll share real quick. Um, Oh, man. These are just some notes on humility. Uh, Humility is the root from which all of Christ-likeness grows. Uh, The essence of pride is self. Nothing is as opposed to God as self-sufficiency. In Matthew 21... It's about the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. It says, your king comes to you lowly, sitting on a donkey. Uh, Eric Gilmore says that meekness marks the arrival of Jesus. Where meekness is present, Jesus is present. And then um, roots always grow down before branches can grow out. That's a good one liner right there. Amen. Let's move on to love. <laughs> okay. I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but we're going we're gonna to touch it again. I'm going to read it to you. Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, Did we not prophesy in your name? And did we not drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Yikes. And that verse, I've heard it for a really long time. I've been a Christian for around 20-something years now. I remember hearing it at least 10 years ago and thinking to myself, this verse kind of stinks. Like, Jesus doesn't seem like super excited, happy Jesus in this verse. He kind of seems a bit too serious for my liking. And it was only recently, just being honest with you, um, only recently it started to make a little more sense. So he says, I never knew you, right? That word, no, is the Greek word, ginosko. I think that's how you say it, ginosko. In Australian, it would be ginosko, mate. Ginosko, mate. <laughs> Um, and it's the same word that Mary uses when the angel appears to her and says, you'll have a baby. And she says, but I haven't gnoscoed a man. So how can I have a baby? It's an experiential knowing. It's like sexually intimate knowing. It's, it's so intimate, that sort of knowing. The, the deep knowing. It's so deep. It's deep to the core. Like a... Uh... God said that Adam knew Eve right. and she conceived and bore Cain. Gnosko. Gnosko, yeah. Gnosko. So he looks at them and he says, I never gnosko you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So, what is it to know, gnosko, the Lord? 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 3. But if anyone loves God, this one is gnoscoed by him. If anyone loves God, this one is known by him. If you want to know that that verse doesn't have to carry heaviness for you, the Lord, Lord verse, 
Love the Lord your God. Why does he say, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness? He says, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What is the law? It's this big old book in the Bible. It's really long. But there's this one part that matters more than all of it. that The whole law sits on. It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What is the greatest commandment? It's to love. So if you want to know this verse in confidence, or you see me and you say, Lord, Lord, I did a lot of things, but I think I'm pretty sure I knew you. And he says, welcome, of course I knew you. I can no you. Focus on loving the Lord. It's really the, the best way forward. And I know the story of this prophet called Bob Jones. Have you heard of Bob Jones? Half, 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 half. Bob Jones is a prophet of old. Uh, not that old, but he passed away a few years ago. But uh, so his 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 thing is like um, his thing is like I see you, Denise, and I see three blue ducks over your head, and um, she said yes, that's a good sign, and um, and I see a robe and a and a carpet and this and that, and you go, oh my gosh, the Lord loves me. He saw me, and you connect with. You have to seek the Lord and what that means. Well, he 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 died in 1975. He was declared dead. He passed away. I don't remember how, but he did. And he, he went into a vision with the Lord, and he saw a line of people before the Lord, and the Lord was asking them this question, did you learn to love? He said that he was, he was, uh, he was getting ready to enter the gates, and he saw the Lord say to some other people, did you learn to love? He wakes back up. He's alive. He passed away again. Many years later, 2014, 2014, on Valentine's Day, he spent the rest of his life learning to love. Isn't that just like the Lord? He took him home on Valentine's Day out of all the days. And so, so cool. So really, love is the thing that God said that when he looked at the world, he said, I love it. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, not loved the church, not loved you when you've got all of your stuff together looking all bright and beautiful. He said, I love the world. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever chooses to believe in him may have everlasting life. It's beautifully simple. It's super simple. But it's all about love. It really is. Yeah. You got any more thoughts on love? That was really good. Hmm. I was just thinking about Bob Jones since you brought it up. Uh, He was like prophesying a bunch of stuff that was revealing the plans of the enemy in the future. He prophesied like, uh, he said that he saw people walking around with mini TVs on their hands watching things. And he, he, it is now is the iPhone, but he had no language for it in the 70s. He also prophesied that people would, uh, that there would be a day that would come where people would take a pill and it would, they would have an abortion. And, uh, and everyone was like, you're crazy, Bob, that'll never happen. Well, everything he prophesied happened. So <laughs> um, basically the devil came to him and was like, I'm going to kill you if you don't stop talking about this stuff. And so he's like, oh, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep prophesying it and telling it and revealing your plans. So the devil killed him. And he, <laughs> that's how he went to heaven. And then that's when he had that encounter. But uh, it's the, the same one I shared with Angie about. Um, he, he, he would get caught up to heaven many times. And on one of his, his times to heaven, he said that what amazed him the most was that the people that were closest to the throne of God in eternity were praying mothers. And that's why I was encouraging Angie. I was like, you, you do get a big wow. paycheck in eternity. Your wages, your, your, your wages will not go unrewarded. So it's just a cool... A cool thing. So good. Yeah. About love, one final thought. Um, Growing up as a Christian, I feel like I kind of learned at some point to not associate with certain types of people because of the sin, right? We don't hang out with Dave because Dave likes drugs, 
so I don't hang out with Dave. And I always thought Christianity was about really being, yeah, it's really, really, really being most connected to the Christians and walking away from the world. Because it's kind of true. There is a sense where you turn your back on the world, you turn towards Jesus. But the minute you turn your back on the world and you turn towards Jesus, you activate John 3.16. He says, but I love the world. So you have to suddenly look back at it. Go. And Jesus said in John 20 that as the Father sent me, so I send you. Come on. So as God so loved the world, he sent his son. So God so loved the world, the church has been sent into the world, not to hide from the world. Yeah. And in terms of like associating with people that are like, let me read you some scripture. This is 1 Corinthians 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and, and, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away. For I indeed, as absent in the body but present in the spirit, I have already judged as though I were present concerning him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are, gathering, when you, when you are gathered together along with, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that even a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly unleavened. In terms of the leaven and the lump, it's in the Christians. It's not in the world. It's the guy that says, I'm all for Jesus, and I'm sleeping around with my father's wife. This is a few verses later. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of the world. I didn't mean them. Or with the covetous, or exhaustioners, or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named brother who is a fornicator, and it goes on. The whole point of not keeping company with these people has nothing to do with those in the world. We're supposed to reach those. We're supposed to hang out with Dave who likes drugs. We are. We're supposed to reach him and be the light of the world to him. But in terms of the brethren, that's where, that's where you have to have relationship and handle the situations differently. It's not about avoiding them. I dare say this. We don't like judgment in general. Paul says he judged the guy. He judged the Christian. Judgment, I do not believe it's for non-believers. You judge them, you say, you can say, you can recognize sinner, but we don't judge them and hold them to a higher standard because they don't walk in the higher standard. They're not connected to it. They don't know it. The high standard is actually for the people of God. Judgment, I, this, this sounds controversial, but... First Peter says, if judgment begins with the house of God... It's for the righteous. Judgment is for us. Judgment does not extinguish relationship in the name of your doings. But it does point you to all truth. So love the unbeliever. For God loved the world that he sent his son. Yeah. And to loop it back around to where we begin with honor... Of like you were saying, even even when we when we you know judgment can be kind of a scary word sometimes, but it it's it's in a sense it's to discern or form an opinion about, and then you set a boundary with it, and so when we when judgment begins in the house of God, it's not the you messed up so I, you get cut off. Yeah. It's if you choose to not forsake that identity, to have a better one. If an you choose to want to cling to, to that sinful life, then you can have it. Yeah. But you, you can't have it here. Because that doesn't make it in here. Amen. Anyways. I love it. So these three ethics. That felt like a harsh word at the end, but I'm, I'm praying that it wasn't stern. It was really good. Sense. 
It was really good. Yeah. It was Bible. Yeah, I mean, it's in there, so take it up with Paul. Um, <laughs> these ethics are how the Lord treats you. Yeah? They pre-existed. They're going to post-exist. How the Lord first treats us. Yeah. That I felt, to, I wrote this down after the first service. I felt to share this because... Um, Conviction is really healthy, but if we don't obey our convictions, it actually will produce condemnation. And so some, sometimes it's like, oh, well, great, well, now I, I didn't obey and now I feel condemned. Or I, you know, sometimes people will get into a backslidden state, but still the answer is as simple as just repent. Come on. Just confess that, just turn that, just return to the Lord and just repent. Repentance doesn't have to be this super hard, difficult, long thing. Um, I wanted to remind us that, that we love because God first loved. We, God does not, like, it, you know, he didn't introduce love to creation. It pre-existed creation. And so God doesn't see man in his fallen state and say, oh, well, you better love. You know, he, that was what happened when they got put under the law, but we're not under the law, we're under grace. Amen. And so we don't have to first love God. God first loves us so that we can love God. And so um, it says that the love of God in Romans 5 is poured out. I love that it's the word poured. Because <laughs> if we humble ourselves, it says in Second, Second Chronicles 7 verse 14 that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, repent of their sins and pray, then I will heal their land. And so when we humble ourselves before the Lord, he gives grace to the humble. And the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. I love it. It's like a, the perfect imagery of Jesus' baptism. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit was, in a sense, poured out upon him. And the Father said, this is my beloved Son. <laughs> And so we enter into that same connection with the Father and have that same relationship with the Father that Jesus did because of his blood. And there's now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. No condemnation means no condemnation. Yeah. Jesus said in John 17 that the Father has loved you even as he loved me. That the Father loves us the same way that he loves Jesus. That's incredible. That's amazing. So, Thank you, we get to be beloved, beloved children. Yeah. I love it. Amen. Can we pray for you? Why don't you stand? And so, so staff or training school people can come forward. <sighs> Maybe you want to put your hand on your heart. Helps me feel connected to my soul. Lord, I ask that you would guide us in the way of honor, in the way of humility, and in the way of love. That we would be known as a people who walk these out. Lord, we thank you for the gifts. Increase them. But Lord, we know that these things, love, honor, and humility, they're the ones that we get to carry into eternity. So Lord, increase the gifts, but increase our capacity to love. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would um, help people breathe in peace today. That he loves you because he loves you because he loves you. You don't need to try to qualify yourself for more. When he sees you, he sees perfection. Yes. 